Well, thank you very much. Um, in the next uh, 18 minutes, I will talk about two things. One is, of course, as promised, if they run, hopefully, I will show the movies um, about how beta cells are being destroyed. And I will talk at the same time about how in the human pancreas, what we know happens to beta cells when they're being destroyed. And it, as you will see, this will raise many questions still. And it's probably one of the reasons why it has been so difficult to tackle this disease. A question probably that many of you are asking, why is this taking so long to find a cure for type 1 diabetes? And you'll see it's a complicated disease, more complicated than many of us anticipated. The second part, I will talk about therapies, and uh, Dick Insel will then expand on these therapies and some of the vaccines that we are envisioning the future will bring for a cure for type 1 diabetes, and also for those who are receiving islet transplants, obviously immunotherapies and their fine-tuning will be very important. So you can see already here on the first slide, the pancreas in humans, actually unlike in mice, is located at an unfortunate retroperitoneal, it's called, location, all the way far back. And pancreas is an angry organ. We can't really poke into it. It's very difficult to derive information for it. So that's something you have to keep in mind. It's harder than accessing a joint or a hair follicle or anything like that. So that has inhibited our understanding of how the disease comes together. Pathogenesis, I already alluded to that. In type 1 diabetes, many factors contributing, and Jeff has uh, gone in much detail on that. Genes, environment, maybe even the degree of hygiene, certainly the nutrition. And the therapy is going to be difficult based on this. We will not be able to block all environmental pathways and genes that lead to type 1 diabetes. It's a very, as we call it, multifactorial, polygenetic, complex situation. How does the disease look when you look in uh, human islets? So in human islets, and we're going to dwell on this um, for a little bit, you can see on the left-hand side, green is the staining for insulin. You still have even many, many years after diagnosis in many of the patients with type 1 diabetes, insulin-positive cells. We don't know whether they work well, and this is something, as you can imagine, because of the location of the pancreas, is difficult to understand. And these cells, as you can see here, also are under attack on the left-hand side shown by red, what we call CD8 lymphocytes. These are usually lymphocytes that we all have for defending us from virus infection mainly and other pathogens and invaders. And these cells become obviously misdirected. Now they recognize beta cells. But you can also understand from this situation the dilemma. That's the same cells in general who are trying to defend yourself from infections. Now, these cells get misdirected, they recognize beta cells. But lowering them therapeutically, the art of this will be that we have to lower these cells without affecting our ability to defend ourselves from infection. So riding this line is what an immunotherapy for type 1 diabetes will mean. And that's also the complication that we have to deal with, riding this fine line, not suppressing too much so we get infections, and not suppressing too little so that all these red guys are still hanging out in the islands. On the right-hand side, you can see there's also other types of cells. Some of them will be regulatory. Some of them are helping the cells, and we get into this in just a minute. Now, coming to the movies, this obviously is done in animal models because we cannot access the human pancreas. But you will see here, and you can try to click on the movie. It hopefully should run. Um, what you can see here is green cells which are, in this case, the attacker cells, coming from a red vessel on the upper right-hand side. And they are attacking the islets. These are the big green blobby things. So this is all fluorescently labeled in this model. And it's a live microscopy that Ken Kopitas in our group has developed. So you can see there are some un unanticipated findings from this. First of all, these guys making almost like anthrax. They come from the vessel. And they find the islets. And they migrate on certain structures in the pancreas. And they can go in and out of the islets like they own the place. And they also seem, from what we have analyzed, actually have a very similar, similar strategy 
like ants do have. They first send out some scouts, they find some of the islets, and then all the other guys come and they build a nice street. And once this is established, they are sure, like with the ants, they get to their food and go into the islets. And I tend to think once this has happened to a group of islets, unfortunately enough, these islets are mostly doomed because they have this established street. But the pancreas is big and there are many islets. And when we try to prevent diabetes, we can probably go to areas with this hopefully hasn't happened yet. If you go to the next slide, I show you some more movies, I promised. So on the right hand side, and you can click on the respective movies and they hopefully should run. On the right hand side, you see these green cells rolling along the vessel wall. This is also one of the big unknowns. Somehow, these cells that are able to recognize the beta cells, they need to see something when they traffic to the body in this vessel wall. If you click on the right hand side movie. And we don't know what this is yet. It's probably pieces of the beta cell that are somehow dangled into the vessel so that these cells stop, roll along the side, and then go into the tissue. And that's probably our first attack and entry event that leads to diabetes. On the left hand side, you see green labeled one of these cells that can present pieces from the beta cell. It's called a dendritic cell because it um, has lots of little feet like a tree. And it's around the vessel, and maybe these are the cells who are dangling, in a sense, the bait to these attacker cells, and they see that, and then they come out of the vessels. And once this is established, they're migrating around in the pancreas, find their food, find the islets, and then within a confined area, they're attacking the islets. And that's why I will show you on the next, and that's my, my last movie. You can click on the, on the right-hand side. This shows you how a beta cell conglobulation in an islet looks under attack. So in this case, the islets are green, and the invading T cells are also green, the same color. So you can see they're swarming around these islets, and it's, it's mostly a random movement around this type of islet, but it's not good for the beta cell. When you focus on the red arrow, you can see that after a while, this one beta cell that contains initially inside the cell green dye is dying and just disappears. And we have calculated that it takes the effect of about 250 of these attacker cells for half an hour to kill one beta cell. Now when you extrapolate this, this translates to destroying every single beta cell in the human body into about a time frame of four and a half years, something what realistically could indeed happen in the human pathogenesis of diabetes. It also on the positive side gives us lots of opportunity to maybe still intervene and interfere with this process, especially when it happens localized in different areas. George Eisenbart, a famous diabetes researcher, calls us it, it's happened like vitiligo, where you lose the color of your skin in little patches. And I think these diseases evolve all very similar, alopecia, type 1 diabetes, MS, and so forth. You go to the next slide. I wanted to show you, so we have now learned about how these CD8 cells attack. I wanted to show you one big unknown, and it links with Jeff Bluestone's presentation um, in certain mechanistic respects. What we find, and you, you look at the middle slide on the top, and this is in human islets, we find the whole red staining there is an overexpression of certain molecules that are called MHC class 1. It's an immune recognition molecule. And in normal islets in type 2 diabetes, this is all low. It's like a black hole. In type 1 diabetes, we know, especially after diagnosis, and for many, many years after a patient has been diagnosed, on many of the islets, this is high. Why does it link to the presentation uh, that uh, Jeff has just given? It links because one of the possible factors that leads to this upregulation of that recognition molecule are maybe virus infections. And maybe this is in a way how viruses could contribute to development of diabetes. Viruses can upregulate this recognition molecule. Most of the time, if you get a flu in the lung, for good reasons. So the immune system can find the virus. In this case, for unfortunate misdirected reason, the virus Will, would, in this case, upregulate this recognition molecules. And unfortunately enough, the cells I showed, so, showed you that are called CD8 cells, they're recognizing beta cells, particularly when they have this MHC class 1 recognition molecule. So maybe, in addition to genes, there is a conditioning event that could happen repeatedly as you undergo virus infection 
enteroviruses, other viruses, maybe even certain herpes viruses that unmask in, this, in a sense your eyelids for recognition, and then destruction becomes at least accelerated. And in animal models, you can model this acceleration and at least derive from them that in principle that can be happening. The next slide, please. The next slide. So we come now to the last part of my talk, um, just to recapitulate what we have learned and what we don't know. We have learned that beta cells can be in areas of the pancreas, piece by piece, in local areas, exquisitely being attacked by CD8 cells. We have found that these cells are in human islets, and this is known. And the recognition molecules for these cells are expressed on the beta cells and overall in the islets, maybe because of a viral origin. So we can construct a picture where, regardless of what initially triggers beta cell dysfunction or diabetes, at the end, having these recognition molecules and having cells attacking the islet is not a good event. Immunotherapeutically, and I alluded to that in the beginning, this poses a problem because remember, that's the same cells that you need in a sense for host defense against viruses. So now we have to think about how we deal with these cells that have exquisitely well learned how to recognize islets in a therapeutic way without suppressing the immune system in other ways. So that if you undergo this suppression, you don't become more susceptible to flu infections and so forth. And that will be the fine art of fine tuning. And it will affect islet transplantation in the sense because the body once has learned to recognize beta cells will memorize this. This is an added problem. These cells, they do what they're supposed to do ex except for they're recognizing the wrong thing. So they become memory cells like you have a memory after a flu vaccination and so forth. So beta cells, new beta cells go in, these guys will recognize the beta cells again and they come back. And from Bart Rube and other people, there's good evidence that this indeed happens in humans. It happens in islet transplantation. You will hear later about these themes and it's something we need to tackle. We think that there's two ways how we have to do that. One is we have to combine things. So we spread efficacy of therapies, just like this has been done in the oncology and the cancer field, but we avoid side effects to also pile up on top of each other. So we spread the side effects. That's something that hasn't happened enough and it should happen soon in the future. It is at least one of my mantras and wishes. The other thing is we can re-educate the immune system with proteins from beta cells and you will hear more about this from Richard Insel in just a few minutes. The next slide, please. Next slide, sorry. <laughs> one, one further. One further. One further. So I'm skipping some slides in the interest of time. I'm worried about my 18 minutes here. Um, so how would that work, this redirection with a protein immunization? It would work, and that is known at least from animal models that the situation is like this. You have attacking cells which I spoke about, and you have cells that can regulate the process. And these regulatory cells will become very important because once you put a protein into a human being and you do it in a way that you activate your own regulatory cells, you have to imagine the attractive concept is that you can have cells that recognize beta cells, but they don't destroy them. Actually, in turn, they deliver molecules that protect them. So you're in a sense re-educating the immune system. And that type of component, in my opinion, this vaccine-induced re-education of the immune system should definitely be a part of any immunotherapy for type 1 diabetes. Because you're only re-educating a cell that will go to the pancreas or lymph node there, not the whole immune system. That means you re-educate locally, you're not re-educating in the brain or the lung or in the gut in the ideal case. So side effects, at least what we know from animal models, are very low. And it makes it attractive because you could imagine that patients could take these vaccines throughout the life and only re-educating what has gone wrong in the beginning, which is the destruction of the beta cells. The next slide. Combination therapies. I already alluded to that and go one slide further, please. Combination therapies, just to reiterate this, and this, I do this because the progress on these has been low for various reasons. The purpose is to enhance efficacy and to spread side effects, like it's shown on the bottom of this slide. And 
to do that type of thing, you would have to, and this is the unfortunate part, have different entities work together. You have to have pharma work together who are making a drug that can suppress the immune system. You have to have other pharma work with them who are making a drug that re-educates the immune system with a vaccine to protect the beta cells. Now, if these two don't want to play together, it's going to be difficult to have a human trial with a combination therapy. But we all need to work for diseases such as type 1 diabetes that that happens. And even more so, it probably has to happen before the single therapies have reached drug approval status as a single standing drug for type 1 diabetes. Because when you go back and think about it, it might be that in type 1 diabetes, because of the need not to have too many side effects, one single drug might not be all you have to take to tackle the disease. You might have to take one drug and a vaccine and maybe something that will enhance beta cell function altogether to reach an endpoint that is clinically important and meaningful. So people have to work together from the beginning. Next slide. Next slide. So the cocktail of things that could be tried together, and I'm going to close on these type of thoughts in just a minute, is we need something that lowers acutely the cells that attack the beta cells. And there are several drugs listed here that all could do part of that, among them anti-CD3, rituxan, ATG, drugs that are already approved for other diseases. And we would do this for a short time. Same something that lowers inflammation, such as something against anti-IL-1, that also for a short time. And then we have various type of vaccines that we have to develop and where we have to understand biomarkers to bring them to the clinic. And these contain proteins from beta cells. They could go orally, they could go subcutaneously. And the side effect of this vaccine that you could use as a maintenance therapy would be close to nil. So you could induce a therapy with the more stronger drugs and then maintain peace in the beta cells with such a maintenance therapy. One further, please. And as I alluded, you can just click on this. The other pieces in the slide will be filled in. As I said, and this is really for the therapeutic part, um, my final message, we have to work together. This is going to take a little bit of a shift of paradigm of working together very early on between funding bodies who have been very good at gluing things together, but especially between academics and industry who all have their own worlds of interest. And that type of working together at the end of the day, I think will drastically accelerate the process of finding a vaccine, a combination therapy or cure for type 1 diabetes. At the end, just a few words of thanks. If you go to the last slide, please keep on clicking. Keep on clicking. Okay. Just wanted to thank the people who did the work. Um, here, Ken Corpeters and there, Natalie Amirian, who have worked on the histology and on the two photon imaging of the islets. Here, Damien Bresson, and more recently, uh, Shiam Zarikonda, who have worked on the combination therapy. Thank you.